Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back here. My name is Ali Hassan and I have the great pleasure of moderating the very last panel of the day, which is attempting to wrap it up, attempting to sum it up, everything that we've been talking about. And I've been told that you've had very diligent, uh, very productive working group sessions of, uh, with, with some uh, nice questions and recommendations and statements that you have provided, which of course we will include throughout this session. But before we do, of course, uh, I want to take the opportunity of introducing this spectacular panel. To my immediate uh, left is a member of the German Parliament uh, in charge, uh, amongst others, of education. Very, uh, very curious to hear what she has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Wiebke Ester. And I'm, I'm delighted to welcome back uh, the Secretary General, who I know has been weathering a flu and still is still standing strong and is with us here uh, for the last panel, the Secretary General of the DAAD, of course, Dr. Dorothea Ruland is here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We have a representative from uh, the German Parliament, but we also, of course, have a representative from the German Ministry of Education. He heads the division International Exchanges in Higher Education and Internationalization. Uh, wonderful to have him here. Peter Hassenbach, ladies and gentlemen. He is the director of the European Institute of Technology and Innovation. Happy to welcome him here. Martin Kern is here, ladies and gentlemen. We have with us the CIO of the Georg August University in Göttingen, Professor Dr. Ramin Yahyapur is here with us, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, last but certainly not least, all the way from the Netherlands, he's the manager of international services at the DUO, which is an education agency based in Groningen, and which is also part of the Dutch Ministry of Education. Dick van der Waal is here, ladies and gentlemen. Now, a very an eclectic crowd. Uh, I see Frau Ruland is already, energy is back. I like to see that. The, the flu is leaving uh, her body as we speak. Uh, that, 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 that's great to see. Wiebke Esther. Um, this group here has been uh, talking in detail about uh, taking Bologna to the next level. We also have many international participants here. And for those who not, might not be too familiar in detail with the uh, German efforts in promoting Bologna, perhaps you can take the opportunity of letting them know about what is being done to transform or to promote the digital transformation at German higher education institutions. Yes, I would love to. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me here, um, being invited to talk about um, the politician perspective. Uh, we've just decided this morning um, in the Education Committee to go on for a hearing on digitalization uh, because um, I think that is common sense, at least um, within most of the parties in German Bundestag, that we really need to, um, to support a great effort uh, and to find additional um, resources, which in most cases in politics means money, to, um, to help the higher education institute, the university, to um, invest in what we need for digitization. That is, um, first of all, the infrastructure part, which means Wi-Fi on every campus, on, and not only on every campus, but everywhere on campus. That um, is the invest in devices, which uh, from our point of view must be available for all students, no matter of their socioeconomic background, which means that um, it um, must be paid, um, not by the individual students, or there must be um, other, pos other, other possibilities if they can't finance them. Uh, we have to invest in more open source um, opportunities. And then coming to Bologna, which is of course not only the change to the bachelor master system, but also to the Erasmus uh, program and the exchange. We need 
to um, augment our effort in, um, for example, the possibilities to prepare for an, for an Erasmus semester on um, uh, learning the foreign language of the outgoing country. Um, and that I would just pick it as one small um, example for how we can organize um, by financing uh, for the whole uh, country um, efforts that support them. Thank you so much for giving an overview. Uh, for the gentleman in the back, if, if I could kindly ask you uh, I, to keep it down just a bit because I know the acoustics here in the room are so that uh, unfortunately uh, the, the room echoes. So I would appreciate if you uh, could keep it down. Not that they're paying attention, but that's a different story. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, Dorothea Ruland, um, we just heard about the efforts uh, on the part of uh, the German uh, government and indeed uh, this is what your institution is trying to do, you know, helping students uh, on a daily basis uh, to, to inherit and, and incorporate all these tools, isn't it? Um. Not only students, I think the framework is a bit, little bit larger, if you're allowed so to say. You know, if you look at Germany, uh, I would say internationalization is extremely important for our, not only education system, for the uh, education, higher education system uh, altogether. Germany is a country depending on innovation and invention. And where does it come from? It comes from universities or from research institutions. And more and more, you know, universities not only work on a bilateral base, this you can do by visiting by um, uh, physical mobility, more on a multilateral base. This only works if you make use of digital elements, otherwise you can't manage this anymore. And I think we have to prepare our younger generation for a globalized world. Um, and the third aspect is, if we want to keep on the level um, we are running at the moment at our universities, we need students from abroad. We want to have the bright people and for this again, we have to prepare them much better. You will come back to the issue, for example, of success rate and all this only can be done uh, and can be improved in if we include digital elements. Making uh, German students, uh, getting them ready for, for the global stage, uh, obviously a uh, very pertinent and, and uh, important step. Uh, Mr. Hassenbach, of course, your ministry uh, is to wrap up the German perspective, if you will, the German institutional uh, perspective here. Of course, your ministry is also working tirelessly on making sure that um, the digital transformation at German higher education institutions is being uh, done and, and processed successfully. How so? First of all, yes, indeed there's uh, quite a lot of processes going on and of course here in the Hochschule Forum Digitalisierung is one of the measures actually we use to listen to the audience, I think which is very, very important and that's what we are doing today. Um, maybe just a little focus on, on what we are talking today, it's, it's not so much or the, 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 the whole uh, broad set of, of topics which could be uh, dealt with, with talking to digitalization in, uh, in education, but I want to make some points to the international aspects of it. And uh, I think one, one important thing, and uh, Mrs. Essa just, just mentioned it, is, is, uh, is, it, is it actually uh, um, taking uh, Bologna to the next level, or is it more implementing Bologna in the digital age? And probably this is, I think, uh, the necessary step to be taken. And uh, if, if, I, if I have a look, for example, to the, to the uh, results of the last Bologna conference in Paris, where a big statement was made to the digitalization, when I have a look to the, uh, to the uh, approved standard and guidelines, it's now three years ago, uh, where quite a lot of intelligence things were laid down, but uh, the question how are they implemented in, in, a, in, in, in practical manners so that they add value added for the students at the end or add value added also for the teachers because there's a lot of effort to be done to implement these uh, prerequisites actually for mobility. And I think there's a long way to go and uh, we, we talked very much about uh, also the, the uh, blended formats for teaching, for example, and uh, I, I appreciate that very much, but let's have a look on the, on the classical mobility and how can this mobility be managed more efficient? I think that's in itself is name 
Uh, and this is not only uh, a topic of, of logistics, it's uh, also a topic of financing, of course, not only DAD or SPAFEC, it's, it's also a topic on there. Uh, and it's of course, and that's a big thing actually we were talking with, uh, with Duo, uh, how, is, how are mechanisms for, uh, for the recognition of, of results of already uh, a, 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 of the, stu stu of the of credits approved so far? How can that be managed much more efficient and in a, in a consistent way? And that's a big topic, actually. Uh, my unit is just stepping in. Well, we've been talking about the digital transformation at uh, uh, German higher education institutions, of course. We have a representative here from the Georg August University in Göttingen. Uh, uh, therefore, you have the wonderful opportunity. You have a, a German parliamentarian who's in charge of education. You have somebody from the Ministry uh, of uh, Education here. What is it that you would like them to provide as far as frameworks so that you at the end of the day, we'll be able to successfully implement uh, the Bologna, uh, the digitalization at the end of the day of this process. I mean, digitalization in general um, is a challenge, but also an opportunity. And I think uh, German universities are measuring up to this opportunity. Um, but it's an ongoing process. I mean, if you look on your German universities, we use all these opportunities. Everyone has a learning management system. Everyone has a student learning management system. But we have to do more. We should do more and we will do more. And very often you're in a situation that you would like to have things faster. And that, of course, if there's a question on politics, is very often about resources. Frankly, currently we're in a situation that uh, digitization is the hype and there are many project opportunities. So currently I can spend every week and apply for some kind of funding for a project. But the actual work at the university it's about setting up infrastructure, it's about service structure, it's, that's uh, structural financing. And that's something where we're currently not where we should be, because these are very slow processes to transfer. And that's something we should uh, basically address in the long term to better set up this kind of structure. Another question on politics is uh, very often regarding the mission that we have in, in, in this kind of endeavor. I mean, we all like internationalization, we all have strategies to do so, we all um, uh, would like to use more mobility for our students, and uh, in general we also foster open science, open education, open educational resources, we do all these things. But my feeling very often is, um, at least from a German perspective, and there we might be in a different situation than universities in other places, what kind of mission do we actually have? Uh, our normal funding, our, our measurements on what we do is very often very old-fashioned regarding what to do with our students in our federal structure, our regional uh, audience we have there. So if we invest more money into OER resources for teleteaching, supporting this kind of structure, getting more foreign students coming in, that, that doesn't really matter in the resource distribution we have in our system. Uh, uh, would it be sufficient for a German university or, or a good goal to have, let's say, 70% foreign students coming in for German taxpayer money? <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's our mission. And there we need, I think, some kind of dialogue to find out what is the right balance, what kind of, of role do we have to play in here. And there we are different to other countries. Huh? We have countries who have a business model. There was this point in the panel uh, that we had uh, this morning. And in Germany, luckily, Education is not a business. We are not talking about globalization. We are talking about internationalization. And, and that's something we also have to, to identify. What is our role in this global play? Are we just supporting other people? And uh, we don't see this kind of, of support basically from the US or from Asia. No, they are not contributing very often to these open structures. And of course, I do want to give Ms. Estar and Mr. Hasenbach an opportunity to respond in just a moment, because if, my, if I'm not completely mistaken and misinterpreting your physical gestures, Mr. Hasenbach, uh, there were a couple of things you did not agree with, <laughs> uh, with Ms. Yahya Purent. Uh, perhaps you, you want to immediately chime in, uh, give you the opportunity to uh, respond directly to Mr. Yahya Pur for uh, we broaden the scope from the German uh, situation to the Dutch and eventually the European one. Yes, thank you very much. It, it's just, just two things. First of all, it's of course, uh, because the first thing you mentioned is, is resources, which is of course always a topic. Uh, I think we are, we are just at a, at a, uh, a crossing point now where the uh, adaption of uh, new or 
yeah, strategy is taking into account what digitalization uh, makes to the processes in, 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 in research and education is necessary. So uh, the strategic discussion about what are the, uh, the uh, main goals or what, are the, what, what, what shifts actually into the mission of universities, we talked about some of these aspects, uh, is maybe not that uh, open and not that visible as it should be. And there's a very, very important topic in that which comes in because of the digitalization is uh, the, the topic of interoperability. So systems or, or, or systems of not only German universities but, but also uh, international ones have to, have to be interlinked much deeper than we are used to see it until now. And the, the, uh, I think these this, uh, this topics have to be addressed more openly and, and more also, uh, I should say, strategic, but not, not in, 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 a, in a very uh, roll-out oriented manner. So it's, it's a technical term, but just, just how to develop the, the new uh, offers universities give to students but also to, to researchers and I think that's we are not that far in that and therefore I would ask actually the community to contribute here a little bit a little bit more before asking for resources and I should say of course I'm, I'm a representative of the federal government most of the topics I should say that is of course not topic of the federal government but it's, it's land now of course I should add that so it's and and that's just just the last point which which comes together with what, what I what I what I just mentioned is uh, we of course see that the, uh, the, the, the 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 borders or the re responsibilities of universities doesn't end or, or ends less and less uh, at their regional impact. So it's, 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 it's actually, uh, they are uh, be becoming mm. global players again. Mm. And again, that needs, uh, or international player, global was, wasn't, wasn't said that nice. And I think also that aspect is, has to become much more into the, into the uh, uh, strategic discussion, especially when talking about education. Not so much in research, I think there, there is internationalization is much, much mm. far developed. And before we broaden the scope here to uh, beyond Germany, uh, Ms. Essa, I know, I know you had a very brief, brief intervention here to what Ms. Ayapur said. Yes, be because I, I totally agree with you, uh, Mr. Yahapur. Um, maybe that's a bit more the researcher and the teacher talking about because it's just this, a year since I'm a member of parliament. Before that, I was researching in higher education. Um, but you ask for the mission of the universities, and I'd say it's you can you have to you, you are asking this question only because it's a question of how to spend the resources. I feel like that in most um, parts in university, it's the politics that gives policies to fulfill, whether it's excellent research, whether it's excellent teaching, whether it's internationalization, digitization, and so on. And from the politician's perspective, I say, if we can manage to give more resources, more of the goal conflicts and the question, how much money can the university, the higher edu edu education institutions at all spend on internationalization and on incoming uh, international students, as, as you mentioned that, for example, we can lift this up if we give enough resources. So, so we've already clearly touched upon a few contentious issues here as far as a particular German situation is concerned. Dick van der Waal, uh, you, you, you listen to this conversation uh, and, and to broaden our horizon, perhaps you can enlighten us about what are the similarities and differences vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis Germany and uh, Holland to what you've heard up until now here? Okay, a lot, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, but first I want to go to the perspective of uh, students. Well, I can say I'm the father of four, uh, not, uh, not students, but of four children, and they all have been abroad for a year or for a period in Europe and outside Europe. 20% of the students in the Netherlands are from other countries. Most of them, the largest group is from Germany. When my children do their enrollment on the Dutch university, it's totally digital. 
they do it on their uh, cell phone in five seconds. And they get, that's a digital process from data from universities, uh, central enrollment portal, it's called StudioLink, and they get the data from us, from Duo, because we, uh, we store all the, uh, the data. And um, when we started with that diploma register, we, we thought, well, this is important not only for the Dutch students in the Netherlands, but it's also important for my children when they go abroad. And it's also important for uh, the students from Germany when they come to, uh, to the Netherlands. So it's a, quite a, it's a kind of political issue, but it's also, uh, we live in a global world. Our children go studying abroad if you want them to go or not. Sometimes close by, like German st students want to stay close by with their mother and they go to uh, Groningen, for example, or uh, Maastricht, or uh, Twente, uh, Enschede, or they go further. But they will go and I think we have to support them. So, uh, Martin Kern, as the director of the European Institute of Technology and Innovation, you just heard about the big differences, uh, Germany versus Holland, for instance. Uh, how much collaboration are you experiencing in practice uh, amongst European nations as far as uh, the promotion of digital transformation in the field of education? At our level, we experience a lot of that cooperation as in our um, network, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, we have over a thousand um, partners and many of them, actually 63 of them, universities, but also business research organizations. But I think we should take one step back and ask first, I mean, what is this cooperation for and how well have we been doing actually today to, to, to equip us citizens with the digital skills that are needed, because that should be the basis for any type of analysis forward looking. And then I will come back to how we try to contribute to that at the EIT. And we've got some interesting figures here from the European Union studies, which is that today only one out of three workers actually equipped with the necessary skills to handle the technology uh, challenges that they face. And it's actually 44% of EU citizens that lack even basic digital skills. So I think everyone can check that for himself if he feels uh, some of those numbers are resonating with him or his, his colleagues. And that's actually uh, another very good result. So I think before we say, say what can we do better to have the skills in the future, we'd say what maybe has gone wrong to equip nowadays with, with the skills that are needed. Um, now, forward-looking, you know, we have an immensely accelerating speed of technology um, preparation and technology that is available, which I agree with you is a huge opportunity, first of all, but also sets very enormous challenges, um, in particular if you think about which type of skills we should now prepare. Um, secondly, um, reforming universities, reforming political decision-making, legal processes are, are very, very slow. So, so we have an accelerating speed of technology reform, um, relatively slow decision making and haven't been doing too well actually to today get the skills that, that we need today. So, so that I think uh, not an, it's an uphill battle for the future. Now two factors could, could make a difference here and that's two of the factors we try to contribute at the EIT, European Institute of Innovation Technology. One of them is innovation. And when I speak of innovation, I mean what you mentioned, uh, Ms. Esther, is the digital tools, um, actually having digital tools used for, for education, and I think there was a lot of discussion about that in the, in the conference, but also organizational innovation, because it will not be possible to, to solve those challenges I just outlined without that. So I think that we should also look into much, much more. And the EIT is actually an example of an organization that is an organizational innovation, because it connects pan-European across Europe, um, universities, it connects uh, research organization, it connects business, to work together on very concrete challenges. And I think that's the key point. Um, we don't just need to develop digital skills for the sake of it or for ticking the boxes for Bologna, but to solve the big challenges ahead. In our case, it's the major challenges agreed at European level, climate change, um, sustainable energy, more healthy food, more sustainable food um, health of, of citizens, 
citizens, um, raw materials, and digitalization itself. So we actually do have an innovation community that uh, tries to help Europe with a digital single market, digital union, and support digital innovation. One of the activities they do, and they do several type of activities with startups, accelerating them, concrete innovation projects, but they also have education programs. And their education programs link up universities, in their case, 16 universities across Europe. Eindhoven is part of it, universities in Germany, in, in Berlin, in, in Budapest, in, in all, all across, um, that provide double degrees. So there is an inbuilt mobility. Students enter in one university exit in another to do a master degree, a doctor degree, and they work on those concrete challenges. So they do get the skills that they need, digital skills, engineering skills, but they also get skills of uh, entrepreneurship, creativity, digital skills, so a framework to solve problems rather than one specific um, knowledge of a computer code language. And I think that, that's maybe one way ahead in Europe to work more together not just to work nationally, but to make use of good practices and, and to really take up what works um, right. somewhere. Right. We also have special program for, for girls because we think that's a huge untapped resource in Europe. There's not enough participation, certainly not enough digital skills for, for women, so that needs special attention. And we also participate in the Digital Education Action Plan of the European Commission, which has been adopted quite recently and actually brings together a lot of those, those elements and it will need I think all, all the German and other um, universities and organizations, mm -hmm. governments, to, to live up to that mm -hmm. challenge. And that's why I think today's topic is so important. Absolutely. Thank you so much for giving us such an extensive overview of the work of the EIT. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm very keen on getting you involved here at this particular point, uh, the, the results and comments that you have produced. But Dorothea Ruland, uh, you wanted to directly respond to Mr. Kern. Yeah. To, to certain aspects you mentioned and you as well, I think what we need is a much more holistic approach. I'm very much afraid if we have too many individual projects, it costs a lot of time and a lot of money and will not be very efficient. So what you mentioned in a certain way, and I think it's very important for universities to have a strategy uh, in which direction you really want to go. That only if you have a strategy, for example, you can make use of the different programs offered, for example, by the European Union. Or we are thinking about a new program to offer a kind of holistic approach for a student journey right from the beginning until the end, you know, of graduating. So I think this uh, is something what we really keep in, should keep in mind. We have so many individual uh, solutions which will not help in the end. It might be fine for a certain study program or for a smaller problem at a university, but um, the issue is so big. So you really have to tackle it on a strategic base, and it's up to your university to decide how many percent of foreign students you actually want to have. And there might be totally different answers from technical universities, universities in the eastern part of Germany, or for example, for Göttingen. There is no one fits all. Hasenbach, quick intervention. Yes, just to just to add on on that and, and uh, to support it. it it's, I think it's 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 maybe also in, when we talk about digitalization, we have to, 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 to see two paths actually. The one is is actually the 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 servicing part universities have to provide, and the other one is of course the educational and and, and the the uh, uh, research path which has to be provided. And I think the the uh, Visibility of university is usually defined, of course, by 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 its offers in in research and hopefully more in 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 education in the future. But if administration doesn't work, uh, the whole thing is nothing. So it's uh, administration means just just efficient, for example, the efficient processes for student mobilities. And 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 we, in in one of the workshops, I saw a figure. No, it was the last one here uh, in the sessions. How many, how many students and professors and probably also uh, administrative people years are wasted if processes doesn't, don't run? And I think that has to be kept in mind. 
Thank you so much. And you've already, uh, it's a nice segue because you mentioned the workshops in Deeds and I know that uh, you have uh, produced some fine work. Actually, the questions and the statements were given to me and some of the handwriting, uh, they're very good arguments for digitalization, I can tell you. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm very keen now. Perhaps we can uh, uh, start with workshop one, uh, the uh, question or statement. Let's see. Recommendation. Are we starting with the recommendations here? So you can see them right here. Every study program should have an online induction course as uh, workshop. Now, is this all workshop one? Okay, workshop one obviously has been very diligent, coming up with six recommendations. No? No. This is all. These are all. That's what I'm saying. These are all the recommendations combined. Uh, I really, they would have given, a, they would have given an A for, 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 uh, uh, for productivity. But, um, Digitalization is a mindset and a process which we are part of. Academics should participate and guide a company. It's a recommendation two. Um, let's start with recommendation one, perhaps, uh, if we can dissect that. If anyone here on this panel would like to uh, tackle that one, every study program should have an online induction course. Uh, that would improve success rate of students at our universities. So, mm. so simple. Yeah. And even more so maybe uh, when we have uh, students from abroad, yeah. I think, uh, which have, of course, uh, additional needs, for example, in, in, in language and, and cultural aspects. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's actually a big endeavor to, to bring down the failure rates of these students here in Germany. Agree. We all agree. It seems to be that case. Recommendation two. Digitalization is a mindset and a process which we are uh, part of. Academics should participate and guide and accompany. I think no one would uh, disagree here. Uh, recommendation number three, digital recognition can lead to more consistency, security, ownership of data for the students. I think all in agreement as well. I love the harmony here. Recommendation four, don't hesitate to experiment with digital tools. Please, please, go, go right ahead, Dick. I want to respond on that because uh, sometimes we think uh, we first have to make everything in order. And then we wait and discuss, and discuss, and discuss, and discuss, and then we start in 10 years or something. But our experience at DUO, and especially in the enrollment process of international students, and we have great uh, success on it, is taking small steps. We call it baby steps. Do a pilot between a country and a country, or between a university and a university, even inside Germany, and experiment with uh, with, with new tools. Uh, we're working on MREX tool, I think it was uh, mentioned today. MREX was uh, invented in Norway they, and they, it was meant to um, send data from one university in Norway to another university for a, when you do a year or something a, uh, or a semester. But after that we, we, we thought well we can use it for also for diplomas for a whole study, but not only in Norway, but also between Norway and Sweden, or between the Netherlands and Norway. So take small steps, experiment, and uh, well, take, take those challenges and don't wait. So you wholeheartedly support recommendation four, don't hesitate to experiment with digital tools. Recommendation five, digitalization of administrative uh, procedures has a great potential to increase direct student contact. Uh, seems to be... Uh, go ahead, Dick. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you have okay, yeah, it seems to be a, a bit controversial yeah. because uh, direct student contact is not digital, <laughs> I think. Di direct student contact is face to face, and like we're talking now. But I think uh, when the administrative uh, procedures are much easier and much simpler, then you have more time for direct student contact. So the that's a win win situation. Yeah. Uh, perhaps if anyone who uh, produced that particular recommendation here in the audience would like to. Uh, perhaps elaborate, uh, clarify. Who, who worked on that? Yeah, right there. Do we, do we have a microphone? Do I have a microphone for this gentleman? That's all right. Why, why don't we do it this way? It's quite. Thank you. Well, actually, that was exactly the point, Dick, what you just mentioned. 
if we use these digital tools to, uh, to, to make more of the time we have, that we actually have time to get in touch with our students. So basically, you just supported the point without knowing it. Thank you very much. <laughs> there you go. Wonderful if everything works out. Now, recommendation uh, six, quality credentials require a mix of standards and technology. Yes. And then we have questions, of course. We have the questions uh, for this panel. Perhaps we can have them projected here now as well. We uh, heard about and read about the uh, recommendations. Here we go. Question workshop number one. How can prep courses relate to the student's journey? Who wants to, who wants to address this? Here, please, say Yayapur. Well, that's, that's not a new topic. I mean, we know that very often students are not really sure what the course will deliver. And sometimes they go maybe on the wrong journey. And that's something we can certainly improve if students have with preparatory courses or online courses at the beginning, have a better understanding what they will learn in the future so that they can earlier decide is it the right course or not. And that's something that's happening at many universities and many courses. Again, it takes effort, it takes time, uh, but that's something which has been well established, I think, that this is the right way to go. Mr. Hasenbach, and then uh, Mr. Kern. Yes, uh, it's just, I think, uh, very important to have uh, tools of self-assessment in advance very early, maybe, maybe even before starting the courses because uh, there's uh, uh, quite a lot of misunderstandings, I think, uh, concerning the competences uh, one owns before stepping into university. And, uh, for example, in the, in the uh, engineering disciplines, uh, uh, that might, might be one, one reason that the dropout rates are as high as they are. And I know, for example, from the uh, LVTR, the, the Technical University in Aachen, that they have a very, very strong uh, um, focus on that, uh, to s not only to, to sort out, but to give people a feedback in which fields they have to, uh, they, they can succeed with their skills now and where they have to do additional work, and then uh, to, to, yes, to participate with more, with, with more success than later on. Mm. I think a very, very important topic. Martin Kern and then Ms. Ruland. Maybe we can take a wider view on preparatory courses because what we've been doing with universities is actually introducing some new education formats which can serve also as a preparatory course. So we do have master and doctoral program. They're not very innovative in their format but in their content as I explained earlier. But also we developed uh, summer schools which, which is one way to bring a student close to a certain challenge and that is always the focus. You have a specific societal challenges that is being dealt with, but even much shorter one. So for example, one of our innovation communities, Climate Kick, organizes a challenge-based weekend. So it's 48 hours, which is called uh, Climathon. And there they bring together in 50 cities around the world students to work on very specific challenge related to a city, related to a topic. And in this very, very intense sessions, try to propose solutions for politicians, decision makers. And that's, of course, an excellent way to prepare students saying, well, I really feel passionate about climate change, about sustainable energy, health, and then may lead to them signing up later on for a course. So I think this should be something maybe could be done more to actually have education formats that are short and give a skill set in a very short time frame and maybe also one of the answers for the skills challenge for the future in the digital field. Ms. Ruhland? Again, I think prep courses are a very important instrument, quite common already, as you, as you mentioned, to reduce hurdles to go abroad, you know. You get familiarized with the system. It can be on a subject base, but can be on intercultural is issues, how to survive in a German university or others. And again, it will help a lot to improve success rates. Because quite often, for German students, by the way, as well, if you st want to study mathematics, mathematics ex at school is something totally different from mathematics at the university. And uh, in general, I think German universities are very familiar with this issue, and therefore they offer prep courses before students start studying mathematics to get the basics, you know, how to handle mathematics at university. Thank you. Moving on. Uh, question two. How can we use the opportunity that digitalization provides to train students for the world of today and tomorrow? Uh, Mr. Kahn, you talked a lot about skills. Uh, of course, uh, Ms. Esther, did you want to uh, address this one? I, I, I was 
just want to give him plaidoyer for extending the focus on digitalization or what we need the students to train for, because I'm so much worried about the um, what's going on in the uh, social networks and um, on the whole discussion in society that I believe that a very, very important um, thing in universities to do would be to help students more to evaluate where this, what, what kind of sources they have for information and how they can deal with different resources and how they can come to evaluate and to validate their opinion and the news the fake news or the data they get. So I think that um, in many ways in higher education we have to um, come up to the uh, modern, modern digital, di digitalized world um, to, to help students to deal with that in their job but also in, in just society in their whole life. Mr. Yayapur? I think this is a question where we know quite well what we want to do. I mean, Hochschule Form Digitalisierung just on, on Monday issued a document regarding future skills, digital literacy, how to work with data, how to critically question information sources. So that's an area we well understand, but we are very slow to adapt to that. Because this is an area, again, where my initial question was regarding resources. It's, it's not so easy to set up those kind of courses. I'm, I'm not sure whether we can tackle all these questions with online courses. It, it still needs tutoring, new modules, new formats, which have to be created. And uh, that's something that takes, in my view, too long. That's something we, we should already uh, do in, on a more broader scope currently at our universities. Mm. Stefan Laval, uh, did you want to directly respond to that? Yeah, I was, I was reading it again, and I think our students can train us because they live already in this world. It's not the world of tomorrow, it's today. Can we use Bologna tools for the recognition of MOOCs? Question from uh, session one. Uh, who, who, wanna, who wants to take that? You want to try, Ms. Estar? I would say we should, or we must. And I was just um, thinking that today it's, um, it's just exactly a year that Macron hold his uh, speech at the Sorbonne University about the future of the European um, uh, universities' networks. And I believe that that could be, um, could be one tool to start with the European networks on f as a first step having universities in a network allowing the students to um, get credits, uh, credit points from mocks from other of the universities that come from this network. Please, Ms. Ruiland. It might be a good idea um, to include it, you know, in the call for Euro European universities, actually. That would make a lot of sense. We should keep it in mind. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Asmach. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's actually, the call is, is designed by the European Commission and, and we, are, we are actually adding on that. Nevertheless, I think the question is much broader. Um, we are, we are, uh, we have to think, I think, and that was part of the workshop I, or the session I took part, um, of MOOCs as, as modules of a, of, a, of a part of an educational journey and, and the, the the big question will be how must the clue look like around that to make it uh, some sort of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a result of some sort of curriculum. I think the, the discussion just started. We are not, we are not, we have no, no, no fixed rules, but maybe just what, what Dick van der Waals said is, is true. Maybe we should try or we should, we should uh, be more able to, to do experiments also on, on that. It's, it's, it's just, it might be a topic of control experiments, how things could work out here, and of course, these control experiments should have very uh, serious uh, evaluation on. Yeah. We have approximately 30 minutes left until uh, uh, this panel comes to an end, so let's address the last three questions here. How to prepare intercultural encounters in a digital sphere? Uh, I think, Martin, can, you would know a thing or two about that. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, I explained earlier how we have innovation communities experimenting with different forms of education, trying also MOOCs very much, coming back to the previous questions, and uh, they call it blended education, so trying different forms. But one thing we will absolutely not move away from is the element of mobility, physical mobility. So for us, even if you have much more online-based education, if you have much more uh, opportunities uh, doing things digitally, the physical contacts and going into different countries and different cultural contacts remains absolutely essential because it gives you that type of skill set you n later need to cooperate, mm -hmm. to, to work in different uh, multicultural mm -hmm. environments and, and already have also a network mm -hmm. that goes beyond your, your local university, your local framework. So for us, that is absolutely essential. That's also something we've been discussing with the European Commission when it comes to these new ideas like the European University networks that, that should remain a, a key element here. And for us, that is highly successful. And if you meet the students, and in the end, that's them that matters, that's something they, they value immensely. And as that is double experience, having two countries by definition as part of your degree is something essential for them. So I, I think that should not be crowded out by, by digital tools, but should be maintained. Maintained. Intercultural encounters in a digital sphere, Ms. Huyland, that's something that you touched upon in your initial remarks as well. Uh, did you want to address that? Did you want to... The, the how to prepare intercultural encounters in a digital sphere, question session two. I totally agree with the colleagues that I guess in general, in Germany, we will follow a kind of blended learning model, yeah? A mixture of digital elements, but physical encounters. I think this is very important. Um, you could put the question the other way around, you know? Um, uh, in which way can you prepare um, uh, physical mobility by digital elements, I think this is a very important issue, you know, mm -hmm. via a very good preparation in, 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 in the administrative field as well, where we still have a lot to do, but on uh, other levels of preparation mm -hmm. also. Before we move on, Ms. Asenbach. Yes, just, just uh, coming back to the European uh, University Networks in that respect. I think it's an important thing what you just mentioned in, in, in having uh, structural programs with uh, students experiencing uh, a real arrival in the in the corresponding other country, and that's much more than than being uh, mobile in an international cloud. And it's just a point I wanted to make. Now the next question, obviously, is, is quite broad, but uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, very interesting. How can digitalization be implemented? Strategically, um, Dick Van der Waal, you, you're smiling yeah, for a good reason, I hope. Yeah, because uh, well, it's it's uh, in in the Netherlands, it's already implemented uh, by the government, and uh, the Dutch government strongly uh, supports digitization. Uh, they have a task force on um, blockchain, for example, and uh, so. I think it's, it's a matter of uh, importance that the, the, at the political level uh, people think, well, we're living now in a world of, of computers and it will get more and more and more and we don't live in the past. So look at the future and take decisions about the future. How can digitalization be implemented strategically? Does anybody else want to tackle that? Uh, please, say Yayapur. I think there are two levels to, to consider here. One level is what we can do on the level of the university. And there, I think, at least at the top level universities, they have strategies. It's not something like, we don't know what we want to do in there. Um, and that's something that works. What we probably need much more, and that's related to uh, question one, three, and, and four, um, on the level of interoperability between universities, electronic recognition, having a digital ID. Uh, I mean, even in Germany, it's, it's not like uh, you can only digitally enroll in, in the Netherlands. We also have that, of course, in Germany, but if you see uh, if a student goes somewhere else and comes back with their credit, 
that's still to some extent a manual process and that's something where we, we can do things better and that needs standards, guidelines, interoperability on that level. Mm -hmm. And that's something that a university cannot do on a local level. No, it's not like we are going to experiment with three different digital IDs of, of students. It's something that has to be delivered somewhere else. I'm a computer scientist by heart. It's not a technical problem. No, it's, it's more an adoption problem. It's an agreement problem on the political level. That question clearly invoked some some uh, enthusiasm here because all of you had your hands up. So 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 I do want to give all of you the opportunity. The point. Yeah. Okay. The point the point has been made, uh, Mr. Kern and uh, Mr. Hasenbach. Yeah, I'll be super brief just to add two elements, and you mentioned actually both of them. The first is long-term nature of implementing those changes. Just to give you an idea, our innovation communities work for 7 to 15 years together. So it's not a project, it's not something overnight, it's something that needs long-term strat strategies and then follow-up. Um, secondly, you need to go through the whole education chain. So it's not just a matter of universities, you have to look at schools, and I think there's also a role to play for universities at the interaction to make sure that the right skill set already is fostered early on. So EIT also start to look at that level, how can we already look at STEM education, digital skills, entrepreneurship in schools, and then of course afterwards, so it doesn't end when someone graduates, but how can we have professional education, everything linking up. So that's for me the key to a strategic um, solution. Mr. Asenbach? Yes, maybe just two things to add. The one is, of course, we, we need uh, uh, maybe, maybe at the top, for example, of, of the university, uh, the change agents who want to drive that. I think that's without, without that sort of strategic commitment and part, being part of, of, of the university strategy, uh, these things doesn't work, of course. Also in incorporating, for example, aspects uh, concerning the, uh, the uh, possible student journey in the light of digital technologies and digital educational offers. Uh, the, the, uh, the knowledge actually about where transnational or it mustn't be transnational corporations, even corporations between autonomous universities, I think, might be, well be a challenge. So even that. Um, third thing might, might be that one has a um, together then a, a very clear vision how uh, digitally enriched curricula should look like. We all talk about blended uh, learning processes, but how, how, what, 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 what sort of, 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 of prototypes do we see? What, what are they, the, the pros and cons and all that? I think there's, maybe there's much more research necessary concerning the topic of the university education itself. Universities do research about everything, but very, very few on their own. Maybe that's that's a thing which is which is important, and of course, um, it's 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 uh, service orientated uh, administration procedures too, which are very very important. And uh, there is not not so much as I said when I, in my first statement, there is not so much uh, uh, academic reputation to be get, but it's still uh, it, it should be really awarded that well running processes are a goal in itself on university. And before we move on to the last question, Ms. Estar, uh, that's, that's something you know a thing or two about. Uh, yeah, because cause I've been researching on higher education in the field of teaching at universities. And my point of, or my impression from that period of time was that we don't really have a lack on research results, but on implementing it in the practice. On giving the circumstance or giving the framework, the possibilities on universities to improve the teaching. And um, there, I, I briefly want to come back to what I've said first. Um, I believe that in um, what politics gave to university within the last, let me say, two decades, the 20 years of Bologna process, there were so many so much change in university and they're confronted with so many new goals, whether it is teaching excellence, whether it's international based, whether it's the improving um, teaching qualities, um, that I believe is not a lack on getting the, in or, or that there's no information on how to do it, but it needs more, I'd say, freedom and money to implement it. 
Let's, uh, let's take the last question. Question from session number four. Do you believe that the Bologna process also needs to include standards and guidelines for technologies used for recognition and portability? Dick, you want to take that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm not. Well, you're watching at me. Uh, uh, first, I want to say that the Bologna process brought lots of good things. We were talking today about uh, the diploma supplement. We were talking about ECTS, bachelor master. So it's, it's very good. But now things change. And we can wait for standards and guidelines to come, but you can also make them by experimenting and do it yourself. So we, I think we need standards and guidelines, but they're not, 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 not present yet. But by doing things, they will occur. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, that uh, at least wraps up uh, the questions from the working groups. Thanks so much uh, for, for producing them for us and for furthering uh, this particular discussion. Now, in addition to the questions that were produced by the working groups, are there any more questions left here in the audience that you would like to address at this particular point? Uh, we have 15 uh, more minutes. Uh, go right ahead. Uh, and there's the question. I'm bringing the mic to you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Talking about interoperability and uh, electronic uh, administrations and rec recognition and everything, my question to the panel would be, how do you see the role of this EU student card? What, what, uh, will this be an app or will this be a, a login? How do you see that functioning and connecting the different levels, institutional, national and European, and most important, individual, the students. Right, uh, thank you so much. Before you uh, address that, let's collect uh, the questions. Go right ahead. Introduce yourself quickly. Do you mind maybe if we answer the question first? Because I have more of a comment. I can definitely turn it into a question, but it would be rather a comment, so maybe we can well, get the well, answer why, first. Why don't you give us your Okay, if, so, so my name is Stefan Janke, I'm from the European University Foundation. I've been following the day with, with great interest and I think the debates we're having are very interesting. But there's one element which I'm really missing in this whole de discussion and so it's a discussion about data. When we talk about digitization, we, we very quickly can you know, think about tools and how people adapt these tools. But I think there's, we, we're going to meet here again in five years and we're going to have a very similar conference which is going to be called the impact of data on internationalization or the impact of data on higher education. The impact that we are currently digitizing all these tools will also mean that we will have access to an incredible amount of data. We had two panelists that said you, you do research or you did research in higher education. If we, for example, in a few years' time, two or three years' time, have a lot on data on, on university partnerships, let's say, university partnerships, we, we can use this data to improve policy making at institutional level but also on national level. And I think the, the, the idea that we, we have not really talked yet about this data, Let's, let me give you another example. If, if we, for example, have data on a thousand courses or ten thousand courses we can very easily find patterns on what kind of uh, learning methodology works and which kind of learning methodology doesn't work nowadays if we want to do research it's very cumbersome to collect this data of course with data comes a lot of responsibility i think we're all aware of the mark zuckerberg uh, you know cases that happen so you know maybe to turn this into a question also for the, for the panel what do you think about the, the whole aspect of big data and how, how can we utilize this data that also comes with digitization to improve our high, uh, higher education sector. All right. Uh, thank you to Stefan Janke. And uh, to wrap it up, last question from the audience. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Janine Gregersen, currently residing in the UK, uh, Glasgow Caledonia University. I really appreciated the day and I think there was lots of richness in the information. Um, and during the day, one question actually um, kept coming back to me, and it relates to uh, the title of the conference, uh, How is Digitization Changing the, U landscape, the European Higher Education Landscape? And I think what we've been talking about is very much how we can bring through digitization, through internationalization, how we can bring education to the world, how we can help our students uh, become more uh, aware of it. The one question that I had expected, and I think that really will have an impact on the higher education landscape, 
escape worldwide is how digitization actually can unlock the potential for students to learn from the world and so that they can go into places virtually and maybe later mobile where they can learn um, the stories of people, the problems of people, solutions that people have in local communities that might be transferable in one way or the other to other areas in, in the world. And I think that will change radically, I think, curricula in universities, making it more a competency-based system than a curriculum-based system. Thank you so much. I hope I haven't overlooked uh, anyone at this particular point. Uh, now, since we are slowly running out of time, uh, we have approximately 12 minutes left. So I want to give all of you the opportunity to obviously react uh, to what you just heard. Um, and all of you will get a chance to chime in and, and please use this also as an opportunity for your concluding remarks. We're going to start the opposite way this time around, uh, all the way in the back. Uh, Mr. Hassenbach, uh, which question pertains most to you? Yes, maybe uh, <laughs> just a comment on the big data topic. And, of course. Uh, uh, then on the, uh, the European student card. Uh, I think the, uh, I should, should, should uh, say something about my education. I'm a trained economist, so it's, and, and I did econometrics in my, in my younger days when I, uh, <laughs> when I was uh, still still at university. So there's big data topic is of course a very important one to analyze but there's no no meaningful analysis without a model behind it so we should very much very much have a look on what the goals actually of the of the different uh, um, educational or or processes actually analyzed were how they were how they were designed and and the design of course then should be Evaluated also in their in their effects uh, to, to students, to teachers, and, and also to institutions, um, very carefully. And there, of course, is a big data topic, including all the topics. Of course, we know about the uh, data data protection act and, and all that stuff uh, have to be kept in mind. But of course, learning analytics in its broadest sense has big potentials, but with a model topic behind it. And I think that's that's very important to. To mention the other topic is the European Student Card. Of course, there, there was mentioned in the discussion the the uh, some sort of a, of a student ID, and uh, I think that's of course the 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 uh, interlinking uh, aspect with it. Uh, so uh, the Student Card, of course, needs it. We we talked in the in the workshop about Eduram, which is also some sort of ID working every, everywhere. And uh, the, the big topic will, of course, be what is the identifier to uh, take with you as a student with a, with a, with a certain identity, the uh, uh, results, of course, but also the excesses, the possible excess opportunities you have. And this is what the student mm -hmm. card is about. And uh, yes, uh, they're, 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 the topics are strongly complementary, and, and of course, they have to be de developed uh, in, a, in a strong interlinkage. That's what I have to say there. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Martin Kern. Yeah, thank you. I think most of those questions indeed deserve a separate conference. <laughs> so probably will not try to answer Well, we're going to have one in five years, I've been told. So <laughs> Yes, I'll, yeah. I'll be back so <laughs> for that. Um, very briefly, I mean, on, on data, of course, you could also bring into the mix the tools that we hopefully have in the future to manage that data, just mentioning artificial intelligence and others. And doubtlessly, it's a huge opportunity, brings also risks with it, such as privacy. But I think it goes well beyond what you can cover here. Equally, there may be a question back about how we can better use the fantastic opportunities that we may have from digitalization, virtual reality, others in the future. I would ask the question back, how much have we used in education the tools we have now, such as the vast knowledge already out there in the internet, have we really managed to absolutely integrate that into our education system and make the best use of it? I'm not so sure. So, so maybe we will have similar challenges also in the future if we have even better tools available. So that may be something to, to think about. Um, I will just end by coming back to the formats we have, education formats in universities. So we do provide the students with those concrete skill sets. So we have courses on artificial intelligence, on data 
data analytical analytics, for example, in our EIT Digital, the innovation community dealing with that. But we give those same students those horizontal skills to be creative, innovative, think multidisciplinary, and also try to have uh, uh, questioning what they learn and try to focus on specific challenges that need to be solved and that are relevant today. So I think that may be the pointer, the way to go, and certainly maybe our, our courses could be one, one way of achieving that. Thank you to Martin Kern. Uh, Ramin Yahyapur, please. Maybe on the second question regarding big data. That's my own research area, so... Um, that's an activity where, where work is going on. I mean, just last week uh, I had a meeting regarding a project, how can we basically use the, the data that we have in our student systems in them to provide better service to our student. I mean, it, it's surprising that Google is able to recommend now a next coffee shop that I would like and tonight a restaurant. Every airline gives you information regarding your next flight. And, but our students is something where mentoring still happens, let's say once per year or every six months and we are not very good in having a very individual experience at a university where students get guidelines where to go next, what could be interesting for you, you should have to register for that kind of, of examination and so on. And that's something which is for research and uh, that's something I think will happen but it will take time probably. Regarding the student card, I think the digital ID would be something that would be very helpful and Edurome is not the answer. I mean currently we have this traditional thinking a student goes to a university, enrolls, and then we give him a new idea. He's newborn, in, in the, but, but that's not the normal life. I mean, they change universities each time they get a new idea, and we also have to fight basically to understand, is this student the same as the other one that's now coming back to us? And there to have some kind of, of unique identifier, a, a unique system to authenticate to would help tremendously for this kind of. And for the third question, I think that's something we don't have to cover specifically. I mean, uh, at least in Germany, we, we train and teach the students to gain new skills. It's critical of understanding what's out there. And that's something what I see every day, that our students are able to go to the internet to learn from the world, to get new information. I mean, it's not like they, they get the knowledge from today and when they leave the university, uh, they, they stick to that. It's more like understanding of the methods how to, to find the right information. That's work. That's working quite well, I think. All right, thank you so much. Taking the time to address all three questions. Ms. Ruland. Um, big data is a big issue for DAD because, as you can imagine, per year we get hundreds of thousands of applications. And more and more we try to do research on it because we can learn a lot. For example, on um, success of students, how can we better join the student journey, for example, and uh, other questions in this field. So this is getting more and more important. We are always looking for partners at German universities, and sorry, there are not too many with whom we could start these projects. There are just a handful or more. You might know better than I do. To your question, I'm not sure whether I really got the message right. Um, but of course, education is much more than just subject-based learning. And if you think at President Macron, when he gave his speech just a year ago, it was a political speech. It was not a speech on education. And he had a mission, of course. And the mission is he was looking for new tools and new instruments, how to unify Europe. And of course, there are huge issues and we have to think about, and I'm sure the Commission is thinking about, how can we include, for example, questions like values, for example, our common values. Yeah? Um, we did some work on this as well when we started a program with refugees from Syria and other uh, countries in the neighborhood. Um, a digital program together with the University of Constance on soft skills, project management, and things like that. And we think about to roll it out in other countries as well, but especially for Europe, I think this is a very important issue, and I think the universities have a very important role. And I'm a bit disappointed, you know. Uh, tomorrow I have to open the big Erasmus conference in Lüneburg. Perhaps some of you I will meet again. Um, Erasmus and Bologna, I totally agree with you, it's a success story. Several million, I think now four million students moved in between Europe. But why 
it, is it so difficult to get them to be a little bit more active? They were very active on the refugee issue. This was really amazing. We did marvelous programs. We got quite some money from the ministry, actually, to give some small incentives, you know. And they developed marvelous programs. But why on earth we cannot push them a bit more, you know, to get active on other issues. This is something I'm a bit disappointed about, and I will try to, to open a discussion on this tomorrow. Um, thank <laughs> you so much. Dick van der Waal. Yeah, I want to uh, respond to uh, the, the question of uh, my friend Peter, I can say. Uh, um, sometimes the commission is really good in choosing the wrong name for something. I'm responsible for the Europass, uh, but Europass isn't a pass, it's an e-portfolio. The European student card, I believe it won't be a card. I think it's, maybe it's an app, but there will be a lot of big data, open data, linked open data between it, and it's only a portal to get into that data. Well, pre brief and short, that was it? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, thank you so no, Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. The precise, <laughs> precise as can be. Uh, very much appreciated. And uh, we are going to uh, wrap up uh, this uh, round the way we started it, namely with Wiebke Esther. Go right ahead. Yeah, you just mentioned what I want to say on the student <laughs> card, that was so I can make it brief. I totally agree with you. We should be careful with the terms we use. Um, uh, and I would love to come to a uh, data conference one or couple of years uh, from now. Um, because, but I believe that this is an issue which is very important but should like fill another congress or another panel, um, not just the final round. Um, and I, I, maybe I can um, make it up to you because that's the question we raise ourselves in so many ways concerning young people. It's the, on the one hand, you could see that there were so many um, helpers uh, with the refugees, but it's so hard to give them, um, or to, to get them, whether it's politician or the politics um, and parties, whether it's on ecological, whether it's in, 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 in sports and the clubs and so on, to get the young people um, wanting to take responsibility for a longer period of time, which is necessary in so many ways where you need um, civil engagement. But it's their future. It's their future. What I believe is what we need is to give them the um, sense of that they have the freedom and have the time and have the possibilities to spend time and effort on it. and to that the whole life is not only running for credit points and getting the best grades when finishing university because I believe with young people I'm talking to, many of them are just afraid they have to perform better and better just to get an average job. So maybe we should take that for university to come back to um, less pressure on uh, teaching, or on, on, on grades and um, time they need for their exams. Fitting final words uh, to the last panel of the day. For the past 75 minutes, we've been trying to uh, discuss uh, how to take Bologna to the next level and try to produce policy recommendations for successful cooperation in the digital age. I'd like to believe we've produced quite a lot of food for thought here. Also, thanks to you, of course. So much thanks to you for producing the questions and, and uh, recommendations that you have put forth. Uh, and uh, please uh, join me in uh, thanking this wonderful panel for this uh, great discussion. Thank you so much. Now. Now, th this, this does not only wrap up this panel, but as a matter of fact, this conference. I hope you all enjoyed uh, the day and took a lot out of it. Now, it's my pleasure, uh, on behalf of, the, uh, of our host, uh, I've been told to uh, tell you that uh, we're going to meet up on the fourth floor for a reception immediately following this, uh, where, of course, we can elaborate and continue the discussion that we've had here. Wishing you a lovely evening. Thank you so much.